the orchids and stuff. All your tomato plants out in the backyard. And so we thought we'd go. We got there about 10 o'clock in the morning. We did not leave till 6 o'clock. It was two retired school teachers. And man, they just kept us enthralled, showing us everything in the greenhouse. Boy, and three months later, I built my first greenhouse. <laughs> <laughs> my brother kept saying he'd come up and help me from Houston, but he never showed up, so I built it by myself. But uh, how much fun was that? And then the second, the, the first orchid I ever mail ordered was Paf Superhulia. You know, I had gone down to the Fort Worth Library and I said, I'm going to check out every book about orchids that you have. Back in those days, they had two. Two. Rebecca Northern's book, and I forget what the second one was. And I realized we needed help. And then as we're leaving the library, this, this gentleman came up and said, you want to see an orchid book? In our rare books, we have an orchid book. But you have to wear gloves, and you know, I have to turn the pages for you. And you know, it was a hand-painted book. Really, really, really neat. It was so much fun seeing that. So we were hooked. We were hooked. It, we, it didn't take much to hook us, you know. So we got rid of all our roses and our little vegetable garden and started growing orchids. And then I built my second greenhouse. <laughs> and it goes on and on and on. But the, the species orchids, when you look at the name of a tag on any plant, not just orchids, the genus name is going to be first. And this is an abbreviation for Papapodellum. And then if the second name on there is in lower case, that means it's a species. It's something that occurs naturally in nature. And of course, that's where it all starts. You know, man brings these out of their natural habitat and grows them and is successful growing them in many, many cases. And then what do they want to do? They want to wait for a full moon and nice music playing and then they want to make a hybrid, right? <laughs> and so that's what we do. And so it's so much fun to see these and, and, and try to grow these and knowing that this is where it started with these big, big, beautiful, and in some cases, very, very small species that occur naturally in nature. This one is from China. Oh, actually, this one's from China, too. Um, Delanati, oh, that's from China, too. We'll find some other. That's from China, too. But I want you to know that some of these, that configuration of the flower, that beautiful, beautiful pouch, that staminoid right there, that's been recorded for about three, sometimes four generations. So here we are in the greenhouse, and what everyone wanted to do is one growth on a papillobidellum would produce one flower spike with one flower on it. Some of them were small, like the size of this magnet, uh, microphone. Some of them were big, like the palm of my hand. Some of them were as big as my hand particularly the pouches. The pouches, of course, is what attracts the pollinator and that salmon line. And so they want bigger flowers and bigger flowers and bigger flowers. Still, one flower per stem. And some of these big, big, big waxy hybrids like this will last two or three months. And so because they're, I don't, I, a lot of people say they're slow growing, some of them are, but they're going to at least put on one growth a year. But a lot of times they'll put on two or three growths a year, depending on the genetics behind them. So this is what they wanted. Everyone wanted these big, big giant ones with, with orchids. These are the roots I'm telling you about. You're not really seeing right here the hair roots. But if you look really, really closely before they start desiccating, because when you expose them to air, that's what happens. Those hair roots start desiccating. But this is amazing to see this. Now this isn't a nutrient auger where I'm growing them from seed, but that's okay. At least you get the idea that that's a possibility. And so these are just like any other orchid, these nice, big, thick roots. If you see the tips, you know, white, there it means they're actively, actively growing. That's a great time to repot them before that new growth starts because of course you don't want to be knocking off that new growth. And so what an opportunity. Problems, problems, problems. I mean, we could go over this with every orchid, but we'll talk about past, because that's what you did. And so everyone would see this and think what? 
It's a bacteria. It's a fungus. What would you think? Okay, well, it's spider webs. It's spider webs. And so these are pathobidella. We have phalaenopsis mites, we have pathobidella mites. You know, we have work, all kinds of mites that get on these organs. They burrow into the tissue on the underside of the leaf and they'll cause this look effect of a disease. If it is a fungus, funguses grow in a sort of a circle of some sort and they will always, always have a halo around that first spot there. And then the, the, the center of that spot will turn their crop, you know, brown or black and sometimes even fall out. But you always see that halo where the mycelium, where the fungus is growing, right? Where that spore germinated and, and, and that's how you can tell a fungus. A bacteria is smelling. I mean, think about it a minute. A bacteria is smelling. It's wet looking. It needs an opening in the tissue for the bacteria spore to get in there, whereas a fungus does not. And so we need to protect our plants from getting injured because of that. But this is a fungus. Now there's all kinds of fungicides out there that we can use on a fungus, but I'll tell you right now, um, a lot of times I just use cinnamon, particularly on a bacteria. And cinnamon isn't a bactericide, but it's a desiccant. And so if you get that on there fast enough, it can dry that, that bacteria out. Now fungus is a little bit different, but spider mites are very, very difficult to control. So you need to increase your humidity. You need to water the underside of the leaves as much as possible, almost daily until you can knock all of those things out there or make an uncomfortable environment for them to reproduce. Okay, now, here we've got this little modeling under here. This is the first sign that you have mites. That's the first sign. Looks like a fungus, doesn't it? But what's missing? The halo. There's no halo there. And so the insect in sucking the carbohydrates out of the leaf and interacting with its digestive juices in the plant is creating this effect. It's creating that effect. Are we talking about red spider mites? No, we're talking about orchid mites. Orchid mites. They're called false spider mites. Yeah, they burrow into the tissue mm -hmm. and create this effect. Now, what are we talking about here? Oh, what are we talking about here? How many of you see this? This is salt damage. This is salt damage. And so we need to check our water quality. If you don't have a local place to send a water sample in, you can send it into your land grant university. They'll have a soil, water, and forage laboratory where they can test that for you, whether it's well water or sometimes even city water. Our city water, because we have so much calcium in our water, it pretty much comes with a lot of calcium in it through the faucet. But that's why we collect rain. I was looking forward to this program because I had this problem with my cats. I'll see at the end, I think it's over fertilization, there's a clear brown to green. There's not usually yellowing between the green and brown. That's my understanding. Mm -hmm. If it's yellow between the brown and the green, that's a fungus. If it starts at the fungus. tip and grows okay. and waves down the foliage, that's anthracnose. I, I know they're sensitive to our hard water, mm -hmm. and I use mm -hmm. rainbow. Okay, for my past. Oh. And my frat. Yeah. Okay. This is my main, main problem with my orchids. My past, I threw away through this morning. <laughs> I'll have that brown in. Mm -hmm. It's not crispy brown. I know it's not over fertilization. It's sort of soft brown. It'll be slightly yellow. And I'll take a sterile and box of a hundred single edge blades. <laughs> sterile. Cut way back to the plain green. And I'll put either I have some fungicide or I'll put cinnamon on the ground. Mm -hmm. Within two weeks, that brown continues down that leaf. What, yeah. what am I doing wrong? Yeah, it's, it's either the water or the fertilizer. You know, it's not a bacteria or fungus unless you see it growing in waves. In you, know, you see that halo coming okay. with it. And then it turns yellow. Here's the brown. 
here's the yellow or white sometimes. And then the green. And then the green. And, and then it continues to grow and continues to grow and continues to grow. And that is, mm -hmm. and that is Does the brown also go down the margin? Yeah. Okay, because that indicates salt damage too. It starts at the tip and can go down the margin. Yeah. No, it's just the yeah. tip and I cut it back mm -hmm. and it keeps going brown. Yeah. Okay, then the other possibility could be that you're keeping them too dry. Are they moist? You don't want to let them dry out. You want them moist. You don't want them wet, except the day you water. And you want to water first and then fertilize. If you fertilize an orchid dry, you're going to do some burning. Burn those roots. Yeah. Are you saying I have? Send me some pictures and I'll look at it much better. But I wonder if you're keeping them too dry. What potting material are you using? I have some little coconut chunks, and some of them are in small seedling bark. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Not that much bark. Mm -hmm. I change them every 12, 18 months. Yeah. yeah. Rainwater only. Yeah. Yeah. The only thing I can think of is you're keeping them too dry. You're not watering frequently enough. And then when you do water, you have to water very, very thoroughly. You know, the root should almost be green when you finish water. And that means running water through them and running water through them. Do you see those roots turn green? They're in a solarium mm -hmm. on the south side of my house. Shade. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what's the humidity in there? Oh, I have a water cooler going now. Oh. I didn't need to turn on today, but the yeah. water cooler. Yeah. I'm not even a fan of this beautiful. Yeah. But, but man, it's like it hot and dry. I water only one, and I have two ceiling fans, mm -hmm. water cooler, mm -hmm. shade, I don't want to fertilize. Send me some pictures, and that's I all I can say. So. I, Anybody else have any idea? Who else grows past there? Yes. Well, past, I've seen brown tips like that on some of our plants. Uh, some of the on the city grasses mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. Yes. And we'll have two plants side by side. One will never show that. The next one will always have some brown tips. Different mm -hmm. varieties seem to be more seasonal. Yeah. We've got city water. I don't know what the last report was, but our, generally our water got lost up in it. But it's not an overwhelming problem, but I just noticed that two plants sitting right next to each other. One has one, one, one has always, it. I'll be trimming mm -hmm. them off and the other one will be fine. Yeah, we did Yeah. yeah well, you're fine. soft, you're soft leaf on the Yeah, but I mean, they are not they might not yeah. be the same line yeah. of reading, but yeah. one plant seems yeah. more sensitive. They, they have a huge tendency to get injury on the tips of their foliage. You yeah. know, just, just yeah. traveling from the store to your car, to your car, to your greenhouse, or your growing yeah. area. And of course, any time you injure, injure the tip of a, of a leaf, that's an entry point for any fungus or bacteria blowing, blowing in the wind, so to speak. So. I just water mine once a week. You water your pest once a week? Once a week. That's not enough. Well, it wouldn't be in my greenhouse, you know. And, and you water yours once, and she water yeah. all her packs in her house. Yeah, but I, will, I water once a week, and then on Wednesday, I go around and spray water. I missed her. I missed her. I missed her. Maybe I hungry dogs. Yeah. Mine actually goes into the I mean, I spray with the spray bottles. But you do a, yeah. a rinse, a root water once a week. Yeah. But she grows in the house. So maybe they'll go to the back way as quick as in a greenhouse. Well, well, and also it matters what you pot them in. Yeah. You know, some potting material is going to stay wet for a longer period of time. Than other part of it. There's so many variables. Send me some pictures. Pictures are the best way, you know. Well, there's a picture right there. Yeah, it's just like, is that your that's picture? Like, no, <laughs> no, that's just like that. Yeah. Well, this orchid stayed too dry in that extruded clay product. I can tell you that right now. That extruded clay product is great for cat lettuce and big, big, heavy things. Um, <coughs> it's got lots of nooks and cranny, and water's negatively charged, and clay is positively, I mean, Clay's not going to charge and water positively charged, you know, so it, it stays wet longer than you think, but not enough for pads. How often do you yeah. water your pads? Um, about twice a week. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the growing season. 
in the growing season. Yeah, yeah. And every other week after that second water, I'll be fertilizing. But that's an important bark charcoal perlite mix. So okay. everyone's different. Every I know. It matters what your conditions are. And I try to keep my humidity at 50%. Misting is not humidity. Misting is water. It's like rain. You know, so when we talk about humidity, it's an air thing. You know, get your humistat and measure your humidity. I mean, even buckets of water sitting around or a couple of bowls of water sitting around and always evaporating in a small area inside a house. I mean, you don't want to humidify your whole house. It messes up your, you know, your things and floors and carpeting and wall hangings. You know, so what you want to think of is micro environments, you know, and if, if, if this was happening, I'd check humidity. And, you know, if you're using rainwater, the, the water should be of good quality, you know. But check the humidity, check the moisture. I mean, even to the point where Mary got a new employee to help take care of the greenhouse, and man, she wanted to water everything to death, you know, and I thought, oh man, this is not going to work, Mary. You know, I, I went and got a moisture meter. You know, and I said, I don't want you, I want you to stick that not in the edge of the pot, but in the middle of the pot, because that's where it's going to stay the, the wettest, the longest, you know. And use that moisture meter. I mean, you know, you just need to figure it out. But I think it's a culture. I think it's culture. Well, not I positive. Have I have charcoal chunks. Mm -hmm. about what, half inch by half inch. That may be too big. Yeah, I use And I switched to a fine bar recently for the smaller bar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I use five. Please explain to me charcoal. What is what is the advantage of using charcoal? Doesn't it doesn't decompose. It doesn't decompose. Charcoal people perlite. Say it, people say it eats it sweet. Yeah. You got alpha on it? Char charcoal um, doesn't decompose and yeah, it, it's a keep it sweet thing, yeah. But but perlite does not decompose. But perlite, um, I think it uh, holds 12 times its weight in water. You know, charcoal doesn't hold much water, but perlite does. And it, and it lets a lot of uh, spaces in there between your bark to let air in. Uh, even though paths grow in leaf litter and there's not a lot of air circulation in there, like epiphytic orchids, you still want to make sure it doesn't decompose so fast. Does that make sense? Yes. There's a fine line between that, of course. And then 